Top of the Props is brought to you by Barkingham Palace Dog Grooming at Lemire. 1 slash 10 Holiday Road Lemire, where every pup's a king or queen. Find them on Facebook, Barkingham Palace Dog Grooming, MacArthur. If you'd like to sponsor Top of the Props, contact us, the 81st Minute at Outlook.com. And we have a brand new episode of Top of the Props this evening, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. And I was just saying to this bloke off air, as a uh, tragic Magpies fan in Campbelltown in the 90s, a cult hero of mine, and many, many Steelers fans as well in the early 90s. He played 121 first grade games, represented a country in 1997, and was a junior kangaroo for the Australian side in 1985. It's bustling Billy Dunn. G'day, Bill. How are you, mate? Good, thanks, Curtis. How's your job going? Oh, I'm going all right. I'm going all right. How's, how's COVID treating you? Oh, mate, I'm over it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a strange setup here in Queensland, mate. We've, we've got 12 active cases and we've only had six, six deaths in the in the whole state, mm. yet we're locked down like it's, um, yeah, like it's the end of the world. So. so you grew up in Tweed Heads, right? So you're, you're back yeah. over the border now? You're living in Queensland? Yeah, I live up on the northern end of the Gold Coast. Um, we were living down the southern end, um, but my uh, my partner, she was working in Brisbane every day, so it just made it a lot easier for her travel-wise to um, to get to Brisbane and back each day. So, And as a sales rep, is what I do mostly, uh, it doesn't really matter where I work. I just jump in the car and go. That's all right, isn't it? It's not a bad way to be. Yeah. But I, I want to ask you a question before we really get started. And I'm glad that, because I, I, obviously you've got to do some research to, to look back on the history of, of uh, you great men that are, that are um, nice enough to join us on the Top of the Props podcast. But I also quickly, a few minutes ago, just searched on Twitter. I searched Billy Dunn Magpies, and then I searched Billy Dunn Steelers. And something just stood out to me. It was like it had a golden aura around it, and there was music, just, just triumphant music playing. And it said, Billy Dunn used to wear a pink G-string. In football games, what, what, what's going on there? Is that true? <laughs> no, mate. It's not a. It wasn't a pink tea string. Um, I one stage when I was playing early in my career, and I think it was actually at Cronulla at the time. Yep. Um, my sister was making. I wore the bike tights underneath my pants. Ah, okay. Um, to stop rubbing and stuff like that. And my sister said she could make me some. And she said, "What colour do you want?" And I said, "I don't care what colour they are. It doesn't worry me." Yeah. So she made me a bright pink pair, a bright yellow pair, a <laughs> bright lime green pair, a white pair, and a black pair. So I just rotated them, and it didn't worry me at all. But the boys, <laughs> the boys had fun with it, mate. Um, this is lo- this they- is long before women in league round and pink boots and yeah. orange boots. So how was that running out in the field for the first time in pink tights? Oh, I was generally no. I generally only wore those sort of tights at training. Oh, okay. I didn't wear them for football games or anything else like that. I tried to match in on game day. They back then it was you had to match in with whatever you were wearing. It was it was either black shorts or white shorts, depending on which club I was at at the time. So, um, so yeah, so it just they were just for training more more than anything, mate. At that time, so, Fair. Oh, so we can dispel that right now. We can knock that off. Yeah, yeah you, you can dispel the pink. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's go back to Tweed Heads. We just touched on it a little bit. Um, you went through Tweed Heads High. So did you did you grow up around the border region? Did you play all your footy up there? Yeah, mate. I was born in Sydney, um, in the middle of Sydney. Yep. Um, we moved up here by the time I was four. Um, and then I grew up around the Tweed area, played all my junior football up until 13 at, at the Tweed Seagulls. Yep. Um, and then we had one of those years where kids just kept disappearing. So there was a little core group of us, that, that six of us, that moved from club to club. We went from there to South Tweed, mm-hmm. um, won a grand final over there. We we made grand finals in every club we went to. Then we went to um, Chugan for one year, and then we went to Balamble for another year after that, and then... Um, up at Coogee, which is another club in the Group 18. You know, so the only club I played for that was in the Queensland side of the border was Chugan at that time. Mm. Um, but I think it was still, I think back then it was still part of the Group 18. That border crossing mix between New South Wales and Queensland got mixed up a few times as we were kids growing up. So, 
So, so way before. So you see it a lot now, Bill, when you see players going from club to club. I think Blake Ferguson came out years ago and said, I want to go to a team that's going to win a premiership. So long before NRL players were chasing premiership rings, you guys in the local competition up there, you guys were chasing titles and sticking together and moving around from club to club. Well, it was more not, not so much chasing titles. We were just a group of guys at an age where a lot of the boys go chasing surfing or girls yeah, or, yeah. or whatever else um, and don't really want to put the commitment into football, still want to play, but just when they turn up, there was about six or seven of us um, that were really focused on what we wanted to do. Um, we loved playing our football and there was especially one of the guys who I thought could have come to Sydney with me at the time yeah. and he since told me regrets that um, he didn't come down mm. um, and lose trial and that's a player by the name of Ashley Burns. Mm-hmm. Um, Ash went on to do a little bit in the boxing arena. Yep. Um, and I still catch up with him now. He's, he, he was a great footballer and a good mate to me. And we sort of looked after each other's back on a regular occurrence. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it was just, it just because we were a core of group players, we added to the skill that was already into any club we went to. And then we won quite a few premierships, but made made grand finals each year and lose some by a minor bit or win some by a minor bit. So, do you think that's still an issue um, up on the Gold Coast or the northern northern New South Wales region? Um, I guess it's the lifestyle and the girls and all the rest of it. Do you think it, that's still an issue for, for up-and-coming players at the moment coming through that area, that there are so many different things that they can do and that the laid-back lifestyle where it's probably not as, as, as busy as Sydney or, or even north to Brisbane, but is, is that a thing for players still up there where... you? You know, you, you might see players go by the wayside because surfing or girls or, or whatever else becomes a bit more of a priority than football. Mate, I, I do to a certain but not only just the um, the local footballers and stuff like that, but I also think it, it is an issue for the Titans as well, yep. I, I believe, yep. and especially their crowds. Like, there's plenty of football supported on the, the Gold Coast, but there's also way too much else happening for them to really support and go to games for yep. teams that aren't at least competitive mm. every game and winning their fair share. So the Titans were winning, say, half their games every year and running 8th and ninth or 10th or 11th every year. Mm. You would get, you would see a lot more players, a lot more spectators coming to the games and, and supporting them. But the Titans, um, it's a struggle for them because it is a laid-back lifestyle here. Yeah, it's yeah. it's different here to what it is in Brisbane. Yep. Um there's so much it's so much easier just to disappear and have your mind not focused on what you're doing and it's something they really need to look at the the mentality mm. of the, the players that are coming to the club. Um and it's something you might want to talk to if you get to talk to Tony Priddle in the coming weeks. Yep. Tony is very much into the mind mechanics now. It's part of a business he runs. Yep. So he he could give you a lot more feedback on that much probably than I can. So absolutely, and I did I did notice that too. And I think I was speaking to you, Billy, about it uh, during yeah. the week um, that I, I did reach out to Tony, um, but I didn't know if it was Tony or not. Then I saw um, I forgot, I, her name escapes now, but Mrs. Priddle's you know mind. Mind um, Eliza. training, Eliza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I'm assuming yeah. you and Tony are pretty close now. It sounds like. Do you guys? Yeah, we we joined uh, the Burley Bears when I came back from Sydney, yep. um, and I still wanted to play, and I did another five years there. Yep. Um, and Tony was there for the first two years with me, and even though we were competitors back in Sydney, the Sydney days. We formed a, a partnership here in in Queensland, and two guys that had just come straight out of NRL football. Yeah. Um, and Tony um, loved the, the the physicality of it. I just loved football. I mm. just, I didn't care whether I was playing Bush or I was playing mm. Sydney or whatever. I just, I'd made it, I'm now turning fifty three this year. Mate, if somebody threw me a pair of boots and wanted me to run around, I'd, I'd most probably give it a go. Oh, no, you'll have someone you'll you'll have someone inboxing you tomorrow now. <laughs> oh, mate, the biggest, the biggest problem I've got, mate, I've already had a hip replacement and I've got no posterior protrusion in my knee. Oh, Jesus. Thanks to my last year playing local football. So. And you got um, you got that in your last year playing. So that was what, 2000, yeah. 2002? Uh, yeah, 2002, I'd, um, I'd finished, I'd stopped playing state league because I was working regularly and I couldn't always guarantee I could get to training because mm-hmm. I was state manager for a company yep. and I was having to travel a fair bit. 
um, and training wasn't. I couldn't guarantee that I'd be there every session, and that sort of put the um, the coach offside a little bit. And I just thought, mate, I'm happy to drop back, let somebody else play, um, and I'll just go back. And I won't even didn't want to stay on their first grade side underneath them because that was a feeder for the state league. Mm. Um, and I just said, mate, I'll go and play local reserve grade. And at the same time, I took up with a couple of club managers that I was dealing with in the business of working for, and. Training started training to do half marathons. <laughs> Beautiful. Why not? So I lost I lost a whole heap of weight. I was down to I was running three times a week. I was riding a push bike four days a week and playing training for football two nights and then playing football on the weekend in reserve grade playing thirty five minutes each side. And how old were you then? I was two thousand two, so thirty five, and I dropped down to a hundred kilos. I was back down to a hundred kilos. I was running. My runs were 10 to 12k a day. Um, yep. My bike rides were anything from 30 to 50k a day. So, <laughs> well, I, I'm 33 now, and I've stopped playing three times. Just park football in Campbelltown and whatnot in the in the later years. And I reckon I'm put on 45 in the last two years, just drinking grog. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, I'm, I finished when I, other than by the time I finished that year, because I did my knee halfway through the year and mm. finished the year and we won the grand final. I thought, well, that's enough. Mm. Um, we thought it was a it was a posterior cruciate, so it didn't need to be operated on. I could live without it mm. um, and still have it. And I was 100 and, about 108, 109 of what I was playing at, so I'm now average around about 113 to 112, so mm. I'm not doing too bad. Um, I'm doing... Because I'm not working at the moment. Um, I walk in the morning and I walk at night, so I... Tend to get in about between 14 and 16 k's worth of walking in those two sessions, morning and night. So that's it, what I, it's I was going to. It's not making me any skinnier, but it's not making me any fatter either. No, so. you're doing very well, and that's what I was going to. I was just going to quickly give you a compliment there. When I saw when I first saw you in LinkedIn a couple of weeks back, I said, "Bloody hell, you doesn't look much different from the footy cards I got from '96, '97." So you're doing very well there, Billy. And we'll, at the end, no. we'll, we'll we'll ask you what's happening and. We'll, uh, we'll um, you know, obviously what you mentioned, you're in between jobs at the moment. So, um, so what? So I know that you're doing. And tell me if I'm wrong here, but you, I'm probably going to word this wrong. But you, you make the like the. I've got the man cave behind me. You can't see it right now because it's not video. But I've got the man cave here behind me, and I've got the, you know, the no wenches and the, you know, the the, the bar club and the boys room and all that stuff. So you make all these different kind of plaques for man caves. That's the side job, isn't it? Yeah, I started the business about a little private business about 14 years ago. Um, I, I, I have a tendency to find I'm not the most handiest person in the world, but I'm, I'm full of ideas and full of thoughts and processes. Mate, sounds like me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I find the right people. And yep. first off, I started with I buy uh, licensed football prints mm. and get them framed up here, and then I take them to the markets and sell them. Yep. Um, started having a lot of troubles with breakages because moving them on a regular basis course, and out yeah. of bands or whatever else. And then I bumped into at one of the markets another guy who was making wood and stuff and got talking to him and he's a retired cabinet maker and everything else and I said how about we could do this and he went yeah yeah I already do something similar to that already and other ideas so yeah I started up a company it's, the, the original business started up as F and D so it was S capital F and a capital D yep. uh, which was originally set up so that for my daughter and I said well if the company gets set up and she ever wants something it's father and daughter what it stands for mm. Um, and if she wanted to do something, there was a business ABN number there if she wanted to go with yep. go along with it. Yep. It then morphed into um, F&D Art. So that's how we, we started the business up, and that's what we well, I run under today. Um, it's no longer a, a, a certified ABN number. That's just me. My name is now the ABN number, but the, the business name is still there. It's still F&D Art. We make team signs, bar signs, shed signs, Stubby cooler dispensers and key holders and everything else with logos and stuff on them. And yeah, I saw that. There's some really good stuff, yeah. and it's not just rugby league. It's AFL, it's EPL, oh, it's all different clubs, isn't it? Bars, yeah, bars. We have a standard line that we carry as standard items, but mate, we've custom made a lot of stuff for people who want. I'm doing one for a gentleman at the moment who wants the Western United Hammers in, in England. He wants yep. the soccer one, and yep. he's in Sydney. He's a Sydney person, and. 
mate, we can do it. We've, we're not copying, so it's not a, a breach of license or anything along those lines because we have to actually carve it into the wood. Mm. And to do that, you've got to take so much out of it. And we, mm. the only colour we put in it is black for the staining of the, the cutting and stuff like that. Mm. So, um, but it's enough for people to recognise their teams and, and stuff like We've done a, quite a few Western Suburbs Magpies for the supporters down there. Mate, so. I'll, 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 mate, I'll definitely buy some off you this year, all right? And I'm not going to ask for mate's <laughs> rates. I'll buy them straight out from you, all right? Um, yeah, all right, mate. Let, 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 let's, let's talk about um, 85. So you make the schoolboys team, and you, yep. you play against the junior Kiwis. You beat them 40 to 6, and then in game two, you beat them 12-0. But what I'm interested in, in, Bill, is I don't know if you've seen this on Facebook, but someone posted up on the NRL Museum Facebook page. Uh, I guess it was a program with the... Uh, player profiles of every player. And, Billy, I'm not saying that football was bad to you and you got too many knocks to the face, but as a schoolboy, you weren't a, you weren't a bad-looking rooster. Do you remember that, pro- that that program? Because in it also it says one of your uh, little side skills, you like a bit of 10-pin bowling and you got an average of 170. Has that gotten any better? Uh, mate, I haven't bowled for a lot of years, to be honest with you. The last time I did it was at a West Day, I think, and I think I averaged over three games, I was about 150. That's that's um, all right. Um, but no, mate, I was into every sport growing up, and um, it was interesting making the schoolboy side because I'd left school the year before because I'd broken an ankle through yep. one of the trial games yep. and lost um, interest in school for that purpose. and. Mm. The, the teacher that was running the football program at Tweed River High at the time, Mr. Porter, he contacted me and he mm. said, mate, come back. They've changed the curriculum. Mate, you can make the Australian school boys side. And so we, I came back. He talked me back into it. And I came along and we went through it. I, I was reserved for every side for the last three like um, divisions of trials. Yep. But made every team going on out mm. of coming off the bench. Mm. And that's how I made the Australian schoolboy side, and it was the first Australian school, Australian schoolboy side that never that didn't tour for about four years. Yeah. Um, so Were we you dirty on that? With him. I was a little bit dirty, and the fact that the second game was also played here at Tweed Head. Oh! <laughs> did you even get to stay in a hotel or anything with the boys, or did you have to stay at home with, no. your, with your mum and dad or something? We did for the first game, but the, no, no, Dave, mate, you were billing it out to people and, and yeah. stuff like that. So. Uh, but yeah, no, made some really good friends out of it. Um, from those boys from some around the, the Newcastle and Sydney, and guys that a lot of them went on to play a few fair bit of first grade down yeah. in Sydney, but not not necessarily a lot. Mm. And you, you, back then, you tended to find that not all of them went on to first grade careers because right. it was such a big step up from schoolboy football, the commitment level, and everything else. Mm. And the money wasn't what it is these days, so um, boys were making more money working in mines and yeah. other bits and pieces than they were football. So. And it's an, it was an interesting squad too, because usually when you see a squad like that, um, and I think I was speaking to David Shillington uh, a couple of podcasts ago, and he had blokes like Cameron Smith and John Thurston and all these other blokes, and I'm trying just off the top of my head because I didn't take notes on it, but uh, uh, besides yourself, Billy, uh, the other names that, that stood out was I yeah. think Paul Martin from Canberra. And uh, yeah, Tony, Tony Costello. Yeah, yeah, Tony Costello, yeah. That... Um, D- Danny Krankovich was at Parramatta. Yeah, yeah. Um, David Rowell for the halfback as well. But no one really Kofi kicked Godden. on to big things, did they? Apart from yourself, because you ended up playing 121 games. But, yeah, it was a weird squad, that Australian schoolboys team. Mate, there's most probably boys in there that had a lot more talent than I did. But, mate, I was just a thick-headed forward and just didn't refuse to give up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically... <laughs> Yeah. Can you tell me? Okay, so what was the process then from there? Uh, that was '85. When yeah. when did Cronulla come calling, and 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 how did that all come about? Uh, it came it came about late in that year, in the in, in the end of towards the end of the year, and mm. both Cronulla and Manly approached okay. me. Yep. And um, Manly came up, and it was uh, I think uh, Mr. Doug Daly at the time. Yep, Phil, um, Phil Daly. Daly. Senior. Daly. Senior. Yeah, yep. yeah, uh, senior, yep. um, and he came up, and I, I grabbed the first grade coach who I had something to do with here at Coogan at the time where I was playing local football. And said, "Mate, can you just come with me and, and have a talk to these guys and, and everything else?" And I had a girlfriend at the time, and um, he 
come up and talk to me. And after we all finished, him, my dad, and this other the guy from Quidgen went into the bar, and um, I went back out because I wasn't 18, so I couldn't go into the bar with him. Yep. And they had a discussion there afterwards, and they offered me a deal, and and they come back out and told, they told me, and my dad said, "Well, part of the deal is he doesn't want your girlfriend to come with you." And I went, oh, "Okay, that's not going on." So, and then Cronulla approached me, and I was a Cronulla fan at the time. Yep. And they flew me down, and the first thing I did when I got down was taken onto the field, and Jack Gibson was out there mm. playing fiddlies with these ropes, <laughs> just twirling them around. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, this is he's this famous coach, and he's just out here fiddling with ropes and, and having a bit of fun. <laughs> Um, got talking to him and, and because I was a, a fan already and Jack was the coach, mm. um, I said, I've got to, I've got to come here. I've got to go with this. And, and that's how I end up at Cronulla rather than Manly. Um, it, it, yeah, it was a struggle. Um, they, they weren't offering a lot of money. Now they're talk, you're talking about four or $7,000 mm. for a contract plus then win and lose bonuses. And back then, in the younger, especially in the lower grades, you're only talking 100 bucks a win and 50 mm. bucks a loss or something like that. So you definitely had to try and find work and, and everything else. Well, look, there was no promises if you went to Manly either because they were both very strong clubs at the yeah. time. Um, and particularly at Cronulla as well, when uh, you make your... Uh, and, and I've said this many times to particularly some of the front rowers we've spoken to on top of the props that come a, a little bit earlier from the 80s and 90s, um, it's a little bit harder to explain to um, our younger viewers that when we talk, when, and I bring up, hey, your bench debut was this game. They go, yeah, bench debut is one thing. It's 10 minutes here, blah, blah, blah. But they all talk about their, their starting debut. But just first and foremost, we'll talk about your bench debut first, the first time you run on in first grade. And it's in 89, mm-hmm. in a, and as I said, a very good Sharks team. I'm pretty sure Gavin Miller was at the peak of his powers then, winning yep. um, you know Rothman's medals and Dally M's and everything else. Uh, bench debut, June 4, round 11, 1989. It's a Sunday Arvo, and from, not memory, but from stats that I saw a little bit earlier, must have been a cold old day because I think there was about 2,500 people there, and you guys get up 20 to 6, um, and that's your first game. Do you remember running on in, in your first match and sitting on the bench, and, and how long did it take before you got out there? Uh, mate, I don't remember, but no, most of the games that I played, in, you sat on the bench Back then, you used to play under 20, well, different eras. It was 20, first off, it was under 23s, then it went back to under 21s, yep. and then it was something else. Cup or whatever it was, yep. Yeah, then, you, then you'd then sit, if you're good there, they sit you on the bench for reserve grade, and then you'd go from there, they'd sit you on the bench for first grade. Mm. So you got to sit there, and usually there'd be 8, 10, 12 blokes sitting on the bench, yeah. and depending on what they needed. So, no, I don't remember the first time I ran on, because mm. I was most probably just shell-shocked, and... And you're probably you're, blow, I, you're probably blowing chunks from playing reserve grade. <laughs> Most probably. <laughs> Mate, the one I the game I do my first game I do remember was a trial match for Panala. Yep. And game, it was against Manly. Mm. And you got you, you said before uh, when I was a young fella playing schoolboy, not bad looking rooster. Mm. Mate, I was six <laughs> six foot one and a half what I am now. Yeah. When I moved down there, I was eighty three kilos. I was playing. Lock, 5'8", or inside centre oh, here on wow. the Gold Coast in most of the time. But all my representative football was second row, front row. Yep. So they put me in reserve grade for this trial um, against Manly. And Chris Choppy Close was playing against me. Um, some other really big, hardhead blokes that I can't remember now. I do remember. I can see the faces. But I remember there was a, uh, we were right on our trial line and I was at Marker. And the, the, the dummy half ran out, turned the, the ball back inside the Chris Choppy Close oh, running straight the ahead. Old inside ball. <laughs> and stomped straight <laughs> over the top of me. I had stud marks from my, from my navel up to my forehead. Yeah. Um, and he went over the top of me to score the try. So I did 18, and I was just ecstatic. That was Choppy doing it. <laughs> 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 was he nice about it, or he just give you the flick and say, I'm, I'm Chris Choppy Close, look out? Mate, he just, he just, it was just a, a wrecking ball because that stage he was coming towards the end of his career. And he was, and, he was uh, bigger. He was a lot bigger than what he was in the early eighties. Oh yeah, mate. He and he was solid and he's still quick. And mm. um, <laughs> I think I, I think I have more memories like that from trial matches than I do from actual games and, and things like that. So yeah. it's just some of the, some of the experiences you remember as you're growing up and or just coming trying to break that 
regular thing when I went to Illawarra was another one. So, do you, do you remember? Uh, so we talk about the next week was your starting debut against Wes at Campbelltown. Yeah. Ironically, do you remember that day? Yeah, I do actually because I remember the injury I copped from it. <laughs> what did you? What happened? <laughs> uh, I remember correctly. It was in a muddy field out there at Campbelltown, mm-hmm. and um, I was running across the field to the, the ball had gone out wide. The winger was got, gone to, had had it was bolting down the sideline, so I was bolted across to try and get to him. He stepped. I've gone to stop, and the feet just went out from underneath me. And as he stepped back inside, both his knees had hit my right shoulder, and basically popped it out the back. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, he, he fell over, dropped the ball, and they called a scrum, and we've had to pack the scrum. And Gav Miller's yelling at me, saying, "Get in the scrum! We've got to pack the scrum." Yeah. Back then, you, you didn't lay down and waste time. You had to get into the scrum. That's so right. I it took about two to... seconds to pack a scrum then. <laughs> yeah. So I had to pick myself up, pick my arm up with my other arm, flop it on his back, <laughs> pack it into the scrum, <laughs> and, and and go from there. So, yeah, until they could get me off. So. Well, you you won that day, uh, 20 to <laughs> 4, so that's something. Um, but, but 89 and 90, um, I, I want to ask, as a young bloke from... I almost said Queensland then, but from up on the border, you come yeah. down. You come down to Sydney, and you're in a a, a, a strong club that that's winning games of football. Eighty nine and ninety. Um, unfortunately, you can only manage seven games. What was that like being in Sydney and not being able to crack it? How were you feeling for those two years? Mate, I wasn't worried. I was, my goal when I was a kid on the goal, on the tweed and everything else like that was I just wanted to play first grade. I mm. wanted to play football in Sydney. Mm. And so I made what I really um, wanted yep. um, by being there and doing it. I Around players like E.T. and Mark McGaw and David Hatch and Greg Nixon and Barry Russell and Jonathan Docking and mm. fellows like that. Mm. Mate, it was just, uh, it was such a thing. But I, I suppose as a country boy, I needed, I, I look back on it now and think, I needed somebody there just to just pull me aside a little bit and say, mate, we need to do a little bit extra here and yeah. and go from there a little bit. I, I look at um, the the players like Steve Edmund, who I played with up here on the Gold Coast, and, and he went to Balmain. Yep. And I think he was fairly lucky. He, he got um, quite a good, uh, solid pack around him mm-hmm. in that regard, mm-hmm. especially with Ju- Wayne Pearce. So I, I met Junior um, in 85 yep. uh, at a, a Blues Awards dinner up here in, at Ballina. Mm. Uh, and yeah, thought a lot of him, and it, it just the, his approach to it. But yeah, I mate, I love being down there. I love being around the guys. It was a club that was um, a good family social club. It was, it was full of uh, younger players because it wasn't such an established club mm. in, in a lot of respects. Um, it was yeah, it was just a, a good social club, and everyone loved being there. Um, we had some different characters at different times and, and players like Michael Wicks, mm. um, uh, Jack himself as a character, Mr. Massey, uh, Ron, yep. um, uh, Mark Shulman, one of the coaches, the reserve grade coach was there. Hogs and Hogs was our under 23s coach while I was there. So mate, they were guys that all ex footballers and all, um, plenty of knowledge. Um, I, I look back and think now I should have soaked it up a lot more. Mm. Um, but again, I was still growing. I was still I, I was putting on two or three kilos a year because I was eighty three when I eighty three kilos when I went down there. I still fit into a size sixteen pair of boys shorts, yeah. um, <laughs> and I'm trying to tackle. And I, I loved it because in those days, especially, they didn't try to step you or go around you. They tried to run over you. Mm. And uh, to me, that was the easiest way to. T- the guys I hated were the halfbacks because they always wanted to step and run and move, and mm. you you couldn't you couldn't hit them with the shoulder. Um, but yeah, the guys trying to run over me was always one of my favourites. So um, I learned very quickly growing up that you, how to tackle and tackle properly, um, and always thought I could hurt someone better with that than I could with some cheap shots and. And, and anything along those lines. Well, so. look, no one could ever say you're a dirty player, Billy. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> not. So, um, look, interestingly, though, um, um, the Illawarra Steelers come calling kind of just down the road. They're not too far away from Cronulla at all. Um, yet, was that an opportunity for you 
rather than stay, stay at Cronulla, did, did you look up, weigh up the options and say there might be more opportunity down in Wollongong I, than there is at Cronulla? I, I did. I did. The, the main reason was I knew their, um, one of the, the administration people, Neil, I knew him from the schoolboy football days. Um, and I, at the time, I was spending a lot of time at, at, in reserve grade at Canola, mm. where it, halfway through the year, I got because I was still fairly quick, I could, when I went down there, I could do the 111.6. Mm. Um, so it's not bad. Was, <laughs> it's not bad. No, not for a forward. <laughs> um, um, but what they did, one, one game back then, because you couldn't, didn't have the interchange like you do now, mm. one of the wingers got hurt just before half-time, uh, the coach asked me to go on and play on the wing until half time. We see how the winger was, he was concussed and whatever, see whether he'd come back. Um, he couldn't come back, so after half time, I stayed on the wing. Um, and then when they needed to replace the player, one of the forwards later in the, in the half, he then put me into the forwards and mm. then bring it back onto the, the wing. Mm. Did too good a job because he he decided that's what we'll do from now on. I'll start on the wing for games, and as the forwards start to get tired and everything else, instead of so they sort of having have to replace them and not have normally there's not a lot of backs on the bench. Mm. Um, they could put me on the wing and then rotate me into the forwards halfway through the second yeah. half. Yeah. Um, so, mate, I was I was a I was a reasonably fast forward. I wouldn't classify myself as a quick outside. Back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what, was that at was that at the Sharks or the Steelers in '91? No, that was the Sharks. That's that why I Sharks. went to the Steelers. I, I contacted Neil because I knew yeah, okay. Sharks wanted me to stay, but the money wasn't a great deal, mm. and I couldn't see um, the my me playing first grade as a winger. Yeah, so right. I, I, I need to get back into forward. So I approached Neil down at the Steelers and said, "Mate, I'm interested. They would you be interested in talking?" Mm. Um, and because of the schoolboy connection. They said yes, and they got me down. They brought me down for trials and everything else. And like I said, I remember one of the first trials with them was up at Newcastle, mm-hmm. um, and I played reserve grade. And they got me to sit on the bench for first grade. And I'm sitting there on the sideline. I think at this stage I'm still about 89 kilos, so I'm not that heavy. Yeah, maybe 90. Um, and I'm watching this bloke run up and down the sideline while we're sitting there watching the game going and. Um, trying to see who it was, and it was Paul Chief Harrigan. On, um, on the wing? Was, no, he was, he was, <coughs> sorry, he oh, was on the uh, warming up to go yeah, on. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, right. And he just, because of the trial match, he'd just come back from an off-season injury or something like that, yep. and he was 120-odd kilos. Jesus. And I'm looking at him, he's six foot four or whatever he is, and I'm looking at him and said, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> He would have looked like Dolph Lundgren in Universal Soldier, Rocky IV. Yeah, he did. He had the shoulder pads on, and he was just, he was bulked up because it was pre-season and, and all the rest of it. So, and I'm just going, oh god! I hope he just tries to run at me. I just, as long as he doesn't move, I I can still grab him around the legs if nothing else. So. Yeah, that that's and like you said, those little things you remember from from going back through your career. I can just imagine how scary that would be. Um, well, I was looking at the other boys around me, and I'm there. I was looking at him as well because we're all just we've just done like forty odd minutes in reserve grade or something like that, and mm. sitting there and back and like those days, you know, push bikes on the sideline, and you you're wrapped up in a blanket, you're trying to keep warm. Yeah. So that would have been yeah, fun. That... <laughs> um, in in ninety one though, Billy. You manage fourteen games, so that's you double what you did in two years at Cronulla. You do in one season down in Wollongong at the Steelers. Now it's easy to look back in hindsight, and when I look at this and go, "All right, we'll talk about nineteen ninety two in a minute and how big of a year that was for the club and the local region." But a lot of the hard work was done in nineteen ninety one. You guys missed the finals, but just out, just missed the finals. But after all those lean years in Wollongong in the eighties, obviously you would have been aware of the history of the Steelers and, uh, you know, not you know not, not doing very well since they came into the comp in the early 80s. Could you feel it in 91? Or were you too, um, too, um, too um, I guess, um, involved and concentrating on your own stuff to, to worry about what was happening and the outside noise? Or did, were you fully aware that, okay, there might be something here in 91 with the Steelers moving into 92? Yeah, no, we we could feel it within our own self. It was a very young squad um, with the Pintanelli, Schipoletti, um, Riolo, John Cross. Rodwell, 
Yeah. John Simon, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, Chris Walsh was the big senior head in the team. He was the front rower. Yep. And getting to talk to Chris, because he spent a lot of time at, at St. George. Mm-hmm. And it was, he was a great person to have there and to talk to and, 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 and to bounce things off. Um, being a, a big, big front rower and things like that. Uh, Ian Russell was the other great player there. Yeah. Mate, he, uh, we missed him. I watched the 92 preliminary final just the other day on Foxtel. Yep. And we, we missed him terribly because he'd torn his hamstring off the bone. Mm. And it had, it had gone undiagnosed for, so, for quite a long time. Mm. Um, so by the time they did diagnose, that the the part of the muscle had actually died. Um, so it, it really, it really hampered any recovery for him, and I think it, it more than it most probably ended the best parts of his career. Anyway, yeah, so. absolutely. Um, so, um, but no, the yeah, boys so, were sorry, just go, go good. It was a really family club, and all fun, young blokes. We, we we hung around together. We did stuff together. Hmm. Again, I was still working full time at the time. I, I was um, I did three and a half years there with the radio station. Oh, Wave or Power? Yeah, well, was it Wave yeah, or Wave, wave FM? FM. Yeah. It was 2WL when it first started in AM. Yep. And it went to FM and became Wave FM. So you were doing um, that while you were playing? Yeah, I was there. Beautiful. Uh, one of the reps on the road selling advertising and a discussion with the owner of the radio station um, who uh, from Sydney. And he got me in in the last year to... Um, Start doing the, the the morning breakfast show with them and discussing prior to on Fridays going in and talking about the upcoming game for the weekend and then on Mondays a a recall of what happened and why we why we didn't win or why we did win. So that's amazing. I, look, I, I said to Steve Jackson in the last podcast, I said, "Mate, you've got a really good voice. How, how come you haven't done radio?" I was going to ask you the same thing question, but you have done it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, um, and it was fun, and we were one of the first to do it. Um, in, in it, it, would have been, it would have been different back then in the early nineties to have, you know, that to, to to not just be a footy player on radio, but to be yeah. entertaining and know that you have to be entertaining and and be, um, you know, engaging and, and all the rest of it. I'm sure you were aware of what you're doing because you well, know, Parso was really good because he was he's a long term breakfast announcer down there mm. at there then, and and he um, helped a lot. And I copped a fair bit of ribbing about it, but what the boys didn't realise, it was part of my the, the, the owner of the radio station to keep me in the Illawarra area. That mm. was part of his requirement. He wanted that. Yep. So I was happy to do it. Mm. Um, and now, again, you look back on things and think, well, maybe I should have done more with that mm. process. So, mm. Well, it's never too late, mate. <laughs> Well, this is your start no, tonight. This is it. Top it. of the props. That's it. I'm on the podcast. <laughs> hey, uh, let's talk about 92 for a minute. Now, I yep. I, I couldn't find the challenge, the Tui's Challenge final team list online, um, but I did see the starting sides on YouTube. We did you did you make the 17 for that final in Dubbo against the Broncos or not? No, I don't think I did. I no. can't remember playing out the Dubbo okay. um, game. Mate, there was there was a fair bit of. Um, competition in that back row um, position at the Steelers because there's a couple of older heads and then you had younger blokes coming through as well. Even in, <coughs> even, even, in, me, yeah. even, no, you're right. even in the front row too, you had um, well, Walsh was still there, yeah? Yeah, Walsh was yeah. still there at the start of the year yeah. especially and then Tietzel. Wade- Waddell, um, Waddell, Tietzel, Waddell. yeah, Fritz. Yeah, the, the game on Fox the other night brought back memories because like I talk to my current partner now, she'd never seen me play mm. um, because we've been out in the gut for five years. Mm. Uh, and she watched it and I said, well, there's the stage where I've gone from being in the second row, they've had the, the front row to start to tie because, you, again, you didn't have the, quite the interchange rules you have now. Mm. Um, one's gone off, so I've slipped in from the fr- back row back up into the front row. Yep. Um, and then they brought on another fast back rower to um, fill in that spot. So, yep. And then when, when they needed to rotate the other one, they'd slip me back to the second row again and put the, the um, another front row in. Yep. So it just saved a lot of um, uh, just a lot of replacement players so who you could have on the bench. So it made for some interesting confrontations with people like Blocker and, and Paul Searon. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 and even those Broncos sides the early 90s, you had um, not just Glenn Lazarus, but um, particularly, and I, I love talking about these blokes because they were underrated that worked around Lazarus. Guys like Gavin Allen and Mark Hone and 
these guys yep. like this. They they were state reps, and I think I, I think both of them played for Australia at one point or another. But yeah, no, that the, the depth and coming up against the Broncos back then, you're a professional football player. But as a kid, when the Broncos came to town, it was a different show. So back then, there was the inklings then of okay, we're playing the Broncos. I think it started in the Panasonic Cup in the 89 final, where I think Wally got the Broncos across the line against the Steelers. Yeah. Both teams were sponsored by MMI as well, so he's played yeah. for the MMI Cup. So there yep. was a rivalry there. Um, what, yeah, what, that, that 92 year was a good... If we, I still swear we we should have made the final. Um, watching that replay again the other night, tells me so. Absolutely, um, 4-0. But we were the, also the only team that year that actually caused the Broncos some problems. Mm. We beat them one time through the year. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and yeah, you talk about Glenn Lazarus, mate, he's one of the hardest players to actually, that's one of the ones I rate as the hardest player to ever tackle because because of his shape yep. and, and the way he ran, you could never really get a good shot on him. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I don't think he ever got hammered. <laughs> and I think we I think uh, Ben Cross. We spoke about this in a previous uh, podcast. I think it was Ben Cross. I hope it was Ben Cross. But we talked about how even before players now with elbows and knees getting up to play the ball quickly, Lazarus had the quickest play of the ball in the game. Yeah. Yep. That that how how did you did, would you talk about that during the week and say how do you stop Lazarus? How do you stop his quick play of the ball? Or was it kind Mate, of all right? He's going to do it anyway. Was- yeah, the first thing was to try and get as many as you could in. But back then, you didn't have the wrestle you have now. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't have the guys laying on people. And we didn't anyway. We tended just to two in one legs, ball, wrap it up, get them down. Yeah. And we'll 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 go from there. Um, and if you if you get more in it, you can. I I still think it's a better game that way. Um, Absolutely. Uh, it, it the boys were. Uh, we were, we were fit, um, but the game. Look, you look back, and I don't think it was as quick. But you didn't have the amount of replacements and guys coming on fresh all the time. Mm. And all but the it, rest it of doesn't. It, so. like, you, let's t- let's talk about the modern game for for two seconds. It doesn't have to be touch football. No, there, there should be some arm wrestle. There should be some endurance in the game, and part of that endurance is you don't need to wrestle in each tackle because we'll find out at the end of the game. Who's better out of the two teams anyway? Yeah, the big thing I um I look at back then is that most of the time guys were on the ground mm. um, because you had someone around the legs. First, the guys were hitting around the legs and hitting over the top, yeah. and that was how we were taught. Mm-hmm. Today they're not taught to tackle around the legs; they're taught to grapple, yep. to grab. Yep. I the first one in is the ball. Mm. Um, so they still make lots of yards, and then they'll usually it's all to stand up, stand up until they, and then finally peel off, peel off. We play the ball, mm. tiring out, getting up and up and down off the ground. Every tackle is what tires a lot, a lot of the players out. So, yeah. All right. Well, let, let's talk about ninety two. Um, and this, mm-hmm. I, I can imagine now. Now that I'm aware that you were doing the radio show as well, down there in the gong, the place would have been jumping. Um, you finished third. At the end of the the regular season, what yeah. what was the feeling like? Just quickly, what was the feeling like within the town? Because did you move down? You would, did you move down to the Gong for for that? Yeah, I yeah. did in ninety two. Yeah. Um, I was living down there. I, first off, the first year I was commuting from Miranda down yeah. and back mm. with a couple of other guys. Yep. Um, that just ended up getting too messy and too difficult. Yep. Um, when you say messy, so, was it too bit? Was it too hard to get back when no one could drive? After games, <laughs> <laughs> not so much that, but um, my, my wife at the time was my well, partner at the time would usually drive me back. Fair but enough. just even going down and training, you tra- look back then you train three days a week down there yeah, and yeah. then work and working and stuff like that. So, um, so and because it pays what they were back then, you, you weren't making a lot of money, or I was, mm. uh, and that's the big thing. So you were trying to fit in around your work schedule, yeah, and then and then everything else. And like I said, the radio gig came along, so that helped. So that was a main reason to, to move down there full time. Yeah, um, and then yeah, I ended up buying a little townhouse in Kiraville, and then Beautiful. before I left after the end of, at the end of it after West, because I was still living in Wollongong when I was out at West. Yeah, um, and we were, we bought a house out at Fig Tree Heights. 
beautiful. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I lived at Mangdon for a little bit, just next to Fig Tree, just there, yeah. uh, right near Illawarra Grammar School, Tiggs. So uh, yeah, well, not, we're not too far away. We're, we were on the back of the Fig Tree Heights public school. They, there they you go. divided a, a block of land, a part of the school land, and then subdivided and put some some blocks on it. So beautiful. Well, look, lovely I've, view into the escarpment. Absolutely, look, well, it's a good view down in the Gong. You can. It, it doesn't matter what way you look. There's a good view in the Gong. <laughs> um, let, let's talk about um, someone that's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, um, Graham Murray. Now, yep. he, he was an amazing coach, and he'd done amazing things, not only at the Steelers, but at the Roosters. He got them to the grand final, and also the Cowboys in 2005. Now, what, mm. I, what, I, what I've read and what I've heard from other blokes about Gray Murray is he wasn't only a great coach, but he, he got people together, and he wasn't afraid yep. to have a beer with the boys. What do you remember of Gray Murray? Mate, I remember a lot about Graham. He was a guy that, yeah, that... It, it, Part of the boys, he was part of the team, he was yep. part of the, the, the group. He'd sit down and have a beer with you. If he lost his nana, you knew it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. But yeah, he, he um he he very processed in the way he did things. He did have a schooling background, um, and he was a, he was a good coach. He, mm. he knew how to get most players going. I did find out after after I'd left there, it was something he'd had a discussion with my wife at the time and said. She said, I don't know how to read, Bill. Sometimes I'm, I'm talking to him, I'm looking at him, and it's just he's looking back at me, but it, I just don't know what's going on behind his, <laughs> behind his eyes. Well, what, what was that about? Oh, it's just he said he wasn't sure how to get the best out of me or what he what um, he wanted, whether he re, whether I realised what he wanted from me. And I said, yeah, I'm just that's the way I, I look at him. I, I I I tend to just I do I just. Being a salesperson, you, you know how you just look at people, and that's what yeah. you do. And, um, and but yeah, I always thought I was doing what he wanted, and mm. he just said he couldn't read me. That was all. So, well, that's not such a bad just, thing, mate. Because I, I spent a few yeah. years in advertising sales at uh, Reader's Digest magazine, and it's a bit the same because when you're talking to someone, you, you're not only listening to what they're saying and computing what you need to put back in your head, but you're thinking yeah. you're thinking about the next thing you're going to say as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So yeah. that's how I was working. I'm, I'm listening to him, trying to put it into process and learn what I need to do and get it out there. But yeah, he he said I was just one of the hard ones for him to actually read and understand. Well, that's a compliment. So. That's a compliment. I think <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> well, okay. So let's get let's let's um, dive deep into the finals of '92, which you touched on a little bit already. Um, your first week of the finals, you come up against your big brothers, so to speak, St. George, you beat them 18-16. So you go through, yep. and to explain to people, I, I love this final series. I grew up as a little kid. I was born in 86. So when I was growing up 6-7 and could compute the finals, this is what I remember. The top five, you know, one week you, you need to qualify. If you lose from the top three or whatever, you go back and play the winner 4-5. So you beat mm. St. George 18-16. You, you guys are flying. You get back. From, you get back to Wollongong. You, you would have had. You would have been at the Steelers Club. You're on radio. I mean, you would have. Been, you would have been on cloud nine. And then you. And then. Yeah. And then you've you've beaten the Broncos in the two is new challenge. And mm -hmm. you and you're ready to play them at the SFS. And you you go down by and I and I mean this like truly twenty two twelve. It's not much of a margin. So no, we we come out of the blocks fairly quickly in yeah, that game as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, you did. Um, uh, they ran over us in the end, I think, more than anything. Mm. Yeah. So so what happened? Um, but, so so what happened after that though? So you, you got twenty two twelve. That was to make the grand final, which people don't. If they look just back on stats and the numbers, if they Google it and go on the Rugby League Project or Wikipedia, they might not understand that that was to to be the first team into the grand final, right? So yep. You still get another chance, and you come back, and you've got St. George again. What was the feeling, not, not forget Wollongong for a minute, but just as a team at Wollongong Sports Ground in your last training session on the Thursday, Friday, whatever it was, Gray Murray's got you all together, you finished training. What, what, what was the last thing that you guys said to each other before you, you came up to Sydney for that, that, um, that prelim against St. George? No, we were saying, we, we can do this. We know how to do this. We've mm. done it. Let's get it done. Um, and 
mate, I, I, like I said, I what, only watched the game in the last week, mm. and I, I, I still, I, I still shake my head and saying we we had two tries, I think disallowed for forward passes. We had another one that we should all we had to do is catch and pass, and we would have scored. All and wish he had another one where all he had to do was catch it and fall over, and he would have scored. Yeah. Um. So in St George, I know they had two tries disallowed as well, but I think we had a lot more opportunities. Is this allowed or, or not? But, and I still don't know. Realistically, don't know how we lost it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Ian Russell. So it was four nil. If Russell plays, do you guys win? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Russo. Russo was a force on his own. Yeah. Um. His defensive. His defense. He had. I still remember playing with him, and he had that Cumberland throw tackle that he did. Yeah, and yeah. I always thought, oh, thank God I'm not playing against him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people in Wollongong don't realise how much of a superstar Ian Russell was. You know, like I've got fans, uh, not fans, friends, <laughs> friends and mates um, that come from Wollongong, um, even teachers, you know, from, from my high school in Campbelltown. A lot of teachers um, like to come up from Wollongong and work in local Campbelltown high schools. They um, all talk about Ian Russell and say he's the best player I've ever seen. What, what Mate, was he that good? He had everything. He the the, the, the only thing Russell didn't have was maybe he couldn't do a hundred and twelve seconds. Um, yeah. But he, he could. He had ball skills. He had strength. He was a great defender. Um, and he just created things for players around him and stuff mm. like. That. He made he made Johnny Simons a lot better as well in mm. in that regard. And it, it, it was something he was the link between the forwards and the backs in a lot of in a lot of occasions. And yeah, to, to have him missing was a, was a major um, drawback for us in that in that yeah. those games. So. All right, so ninety three, and and we talk about hangovers in rugby league. I'm not going to call this a hangover because. You guys end up missing the finals barely. Like, you, you're almost there again. But to me, from the outside looking in, 92 was such a huge year for the Steelers in the local area that it's almost impossible to back it up unless you're going to go undefeated and, um, you know, win the comp like that. What, what was the understanding of the team coming into 93? Was there, was there a presence there like, yes, we can do it again? Or... Within yourselves, was it like it's? It was so huge to do what you did in '92, from February with the Tui's challenge all the way through to September in the finals. Well, there was a letdown and there was a disappointment in the players, but um, there were some injuries as well. We, yeah. we never really got Russo back yeah. um, to what he was. Um, that halfway through the year, I had shoulder injuries where I was playing games where. I was strapped like a half of mummy across the shoulder that mm. I couldn't lift my shoulder any more than about 45 degrees for most of the, to, for about a 30 minute period because mm. I'd torn a rotator calf and shredded all the calf. And you, you were still playing? Well. Yeah, still playing. I'd strap it up um, for 30 minutes, it'd, it'd stay in place, and then the sweat would lose it. So I'd wait until half time, go back off, and then re strap it at half time. And, um, and it'd last another yeah. 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, which then ended up causing, I played the rest of the year out because it was the end of my contract. And, yep. and um, needed to try and still make an impression. Mm. Um, and then at the end of the year, ended up getting a, a reconstruction on that shoulder. And one, in those days, it was one of the trial and error sort of processes as well. So was was that it? Yeah. So I'm trying to get a timeline here as well because, as I mentioned at the top, um, just searching um, Billy Dunn Steelers on Twitter, there was also a tweet from Steve Mascourt, who was a um, you'd remember as a, a local journalist down, I think, at the Mercury before he went on to bigger things up in Sydney. Who I, I um, clarify as a friend who is now in England as well, but I saw a tweet as well that he said something along the lines of. Billy Dunn, on the eve of a game to qualify for finals, signs with Magpies. Is there any truth? I, I'm, I'm trying to work that out in my head because you guys just miss, missed the finals in 93. The last game is against the Knights in Newcastle. I'm, I'm trying to put that together. So you guys, is that true that well, you signed just well, before I, that game with Wes? At, in 92, I was up for renewal on my contract. They gave me a year. Oh, yeah, on my contract okay. for the ninety three season. Yep. But in the end of ninety towards the end of ninety two I was offered a two year deal to go to South. Right. Um and at that stage I South weren't doing a great deal and there was already 
rumours of them not being around for that long and, and mm. things like that. So mm. I, it was a lot more money, mm. um, but I'd moved to Wollongong and I didn't really want to be travelling back and forth again. And um, That's when I started talking to the radio owner and he got me on the radio and, and those sort of things. Yep. So I signed a one-year deal at, at the Steelers mm-hmm. for a little bit, for less of money than I would have got at South. At South. Yep. And then at the end of 93... The Steelers, because they knew I had the shoulder problem and I was carrying it through the game, but I was doing that because we believed we could still make the final. Yeah, you weren't too um, far away. Yeah. And that's why I was still playing. Let's say to most players, if they had a multi year contract, would have just gone, okay, mate, I need this reconstructed. I'm, yep. I'm pulling the pin and, and yep. getting it done. Yep. Um, so I can be fit, fully fit for the start of next year. Mm. Um, and, but the Steelers came back to me and they, were, they cut what like it was on that year mm. and offering me less again for the following year because oh, you, you've got injury clouds. Well, and I'm putting myself out. It's an interesting um, It's an interesting way to go back to a player that, that's um, put their heart on the line the last couple of years and say, we're going to give you less in your contract because you may not be as good as a player as you were before your injury. It, that would be yeah. a hard thing to take. Uh, it was. And it, 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 um, it hurt, to be honest with you, at the time. And... and I, I, my manager at that stage, he was only a part-time manager. I was doing a lot of it myself, and he just made contact with people for mm. me because he had more time. Mm. Um, and he he knew the West Boys. Yep. And he made they made the offer to him, and it was again, it was a bit more money than I was getting at the Steelers. Still wasn't enough, not work to get that way. Yeah. Um, but uh, and it was, um, I think it was for it was for three years. Mm. So and I went. No, they're offering me three years still, they're still only offering me one. Mm. Um, and I just well, went, wouldn't you? No, yeah. I, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought of that way. And, mate, didn't want to leave. Mm. Loved the place. Mm. Loved the people that were down there. It's lived down there mm. when, yeah. when I went to the, to the Magpies. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so um, then I had to leave and find a new job as well because I couldn't work at the radio station anymore. Oh. <laughs> well, there's a radio station up here now, but there wasn't back then. But at, at, <laughs> at least it was a nice cruise up through Mount Oosley, up through Appen, up into Campbelltown. Um, but yeah, the, through the back way, yeah, back through the, the back towns and, and everything else. You had to watch the, the radar and everything else around those places. <laughs> exactly, yeah. They, they've cleaned that up now. Appen Road particularly, I reckon back then when you were driving up through Wollongong, up to Appen, there were so many stories back then about um, people crashing their, their cars into trees on Appen Road that they've they've cleared all the trees out now, mate. It, it's completely different. Yeah. There's there's extra suburbs in Appen and everything. It's it's yeah, really I know. I've been through a couple of times. Mate, different it's places. crazy. But you had two options. You could always go down the old highway as well and come in that way. Mm. Um, uh, uh, depending on where we're about from Campbelltown we were and what we were doing at the time, yeah. you could use two different ways in or out. So, but yeah, mate. I, it, Cronulla and Illawarra, by a lot of feeling, were similar sorts of clubs. They were young clubs were. and young teams and, and everything else. It was a whole different move to, to Western Suburbs, who had a lot of history and a lot of, um, not so much baggage, but no, things about it. Baggage is um, the word, because that's the next thing I'm, to- I'm going to talk about, because West Magpies, on their own as a club since 1908, lots of baggage. Yeah. The fact that I think at the time, and, and I've written about this before on the 81st Minute and Fox Sports or whatever articles I've written, um, a, a, as a local now, that, that that you knew, looking back at the history, the club coming out to eight, you know, coming out to Kelvin Town 86, they had some poor years. They found some form around 91, 92, which you would have seen playing against them as well. Yep. Under Warren yep. Ryan and Jason Taylor and the Canterbury boys and all that stuff. But it wasn't really still... Campbelltown's team, so to speak. Um, no. And then you walk in, and then all of a sudden you got Warren Ryan. He's he's in shit with the club. The year before yeah, you he, get he's there, he's ready to leave. Yeah, yeah, he's ready to leave the year on there. So the, the year, no. the, and, and just before that, there was a big drama between Warren Ryan and a local junior, the Golden Boy Jason Taylor, who ends yeah. up leaving for North Sydney because the club picked Warren Ryan over Jason Taylor. And then Warren Ryan gets the the chop or quits. Um, once you get there, how long? How much time did you get to spend with Warren Ryan before he quit at the Magpies? Not a lot because I, when, that year, like I said, I've had my shoulder reconstructed. I, I got married yeah. um, in October that in '93, and I'd had the operation 
about four weeks before I got married. So I yep. got married with my arm in a sling um, um, and went to Bangkok for a honeymoon with an arm in a sling. So, Beautiful. Um, and got up there and had to do a lot of rehabilitation with it. I was still using uh, Lincoln Web down at Wollongong for a lot of that rehabilitation and work. Um, so I trusted Lincoln. He he got me through the 93 season with all the, the help he was doing for me in that. Um, even though he wasn't a physio, he was an ex-Mr. World contestant and did a lot of um, weights and training and mm-hmm. trained a lot with the Hawks. So, And then so I didn't start the year on the best capacity because I couldn't do a lot of running to start with. Yep. Um, so I spent a fair bit of the first part of the season in reserve grade. Yep. Um, Got to talk to Warren a little bit as I started. But Warren was one of those coaches. He, if you were in reserve grade, didn't really want to have a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I got he the same first, thing. I got he the was same a first thing. Grade coach. Yeah, I got the same thing from Steve Jackson in the last podcast. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, he still had a lot of ideas, and he still once you're in there, yeah. and um, you're listening to him. Yeah, it's it really good to, to get on. West were um, there was a lot of a lot of older he- heads at West at the time, mm. um, and I was by that stage a senior player, so I was no longer a younger boy. So I I, I tended not to put up with the the shit that a lot of the guys want to do. Yep. Um, when you're a new player in the club, so that possibly put me offside with a couple of them. I know one of them that did <laughs> in particular. But <laughs> was that was that uh, someone that had been ingrained at Campbelltown, or they were just new to the club? Um, he was a player that had he was a very senior at the club, and he'd come from a, a, a club that had a lot of history and of winning competitions. Mm-hmm. Blue and um, white, blue and white jersey. Yeah, tend yeah. To be. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right, move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a hard year that first year, and I'm looking at them, figure I left the Steelers for this. Yeah. Um, um, but I got to meet a lot of people. I, I caught up with a, a, an ex schoolboy mate of mine, and Jason Elton. Yeah. Um, and really good friends with Jace, um, the McGinnis boys, and. Um, the boys we had there from England and stuff like that, it, there was a lot of, there was still a lot of ability there. The Willis boys, um, mm. Andrew Leeds, Jumper. Um, oh, don't I, worry, we're about to get to all this, mate. We're about to get to the Tommy <laughs> era, don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, Bill, let's go into 95 then, because you just spoke about 94 and how much of a trouble it was um, personally for yourself and a lot going on. And um, But then Tommy Rodonius comes along. Um, and now, as as I've mentioned several times in this podcast, and people have heard before, living in Campbelltown, Campbelltown Rugby League needed a pickup in general. They needed they needed someone to bring everything together. And I think the Messiah. Was, <laughs> yeah, but it was it was the perfect combination, right? Because you had you had Campbelltown Battlers doing their best, and and the city has changed so much since then. But um, at that time, they they needed a winner. They need someone to to get the the, the team together in the town. And, and Tommy comes along, and I don't know, and I, I asked John Scandalis about this in podcast three, and I'll ask you the same question. How much of, of Tommy's aura was about actual coaching skill and, and and technical stuff, and how much it was individual motivation and getting you up personally to play for the jersey? Mate, how much was it just Tommy yelling at you? <laughs> <laughs> How was, what was yeah, that like? Hopeless, you hopeless bastards, get up there, do this, do that. Yeah. Is Mate, it true? Was, I can t- we'll put it this way, it wasn't the coaching skills. Hmm. But that's it not that's not com- such a bad thing, because the Magpies didn't need that at the time, did they? No. The, 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 the club, the, the entity didn't. So a lot of the players did. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the letdown part. That's, uh, occurrence. Mm. Um, Tommy, as a man, was he wasn't, and he's the first to admit it. He's not a coach's coach. Yep. Um, he's a, he's the man. Yep. Um, I want you to do this. Just do it. Yep. Um, um, if, if worst comes to worst, bash him. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's an interesting. You can't win the game, win the fight. And it was an interesting so. thing, just as a memory, uh, as a kid. Um, going to Arana Park at the time. And a lot of the time, I was such a magpie's head, Billy, that if I didn't get to go to a game, 
I would cry at the front door, and I'm talking seven, eight, nine years old. I would cry at the door until my mum put me in a cab and sent me down the ten minute drive down in by myself in a cab to the game. And I would sit there astutely and watch the game. And I wouldn't sit in one place. I would move around the ground. And and watch. Well, the... You still do that, mate. You still cry if you can't. Mate, go mate, I know. <laughs> I'm lucky now. I've got a, a what I did until COVID. I had a media pass, so I could walk in any ground I wanted. But I, it, it, it was so it was such a big thing for me. And, and maybe it was just at the time moving into Campbelltown when I did and catching football when I did. But one of the biggest memories for me, and I don't know if you got to see this because you're always running out after it. But Tommy walking down the sideline like this great leader of this empire with Jason Ouchen, who you just mentioned, in tow, down the Western Grandstand, down the sideline, the, the windfield blew in the mouth, down through <laughs> the gate and into the, the boxes at the southern end. And the crowd yeah, would the ri- the the crowd would <laughs> rise as one, Billy. Like, and, and, and I look at it back at it now, and there's some Magpies games on video, on, on YouTube, that you can look back on, particularly the, the two big ones from that era, is the Bears game, which we'll get to in a minute, and um, Scando's debut, which was a Friday night game against the Panthers, which is one of the dirtiest games of rugby league I've ever seen, which was a Friday night, and it was about minus 10 degrees, and I was there in the at the northern end in those rickety old wooden grandstands. Yep. Now, tell me, you're from Tweed Heads, you come down, you play at Cronulla, you play at Illawarra, but when you got to Campbelltown and played your first home game at Campbelltown, with all due respect to the people of Campbelltown, and I'm one of them, what was it like being in front of that Campbelltown crowd? Because I don't think... Because the Rabbitohs were, were gone from Redfern at the time. I guess that would be the closest thing to it. It was like playing at a 70s ground in the 90s. But it also yep. got you guys up and won you many, many games as well, didn't it? It did. There was a lot of emotion in the crowd. Um, the, 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 the facilities were... Say it, that was shit house. <laughs> they were average to be, to be <laughs> nice. Not only for the crowd, but for also for the players. Yeah, um, yep. Um, but they were a struggling club and it looked like it. Yeah. Um, yep. it, it, the, but the people, they loved their team. Mm. Um, mm. And they also hated you if, you if you didn't give them some effort either. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, there, there was um, the groups of them there, and I've made some really good friends. I've got one now that I'm still best of mates with, and he's 73 at the moment this year, and now he is, and he was a sponsor at the club at the time, and he, yeah. uh, he worked for me up here at one stage. So, And I worked for him at another stage up here. Um, so the, the people love their team. Yeah. Um. They, Tommy brought that back to them. Basically, yeah. yeah. He brought the western suburbs to Campbelltown. Yep. Absolutely. And and Tommy, <laughs> Tommy too. I don't mean to cut you off there, Billy, but Tommy as well had a certain player that he liked. Now I looked through the Magpie squads of '95 and '96. Bustling Billy Dunn, Justin Dooley. You know, as my dad called him when he got the Roosters, Hooli Dooley, and. Um, really George Jarlis and and Langmack and Leeds and 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 these that they all to me, I, I, you know, they, they were just battlers in one way or another. You got Craig Coleman of the club. You got Hazlitt of the club. Well, they were all one, blokes. One of, them that, wasn't. one of those ones you mentioned wasn't a battler. He owned about three McDonald's at the time. Uh, Hungry Jacks wasn't it? <laughs> Hungry Jacks or something. Hungry Jacks. All right. So we won't put that link together with what you said before that you didn't get on with the other bloke from Canterbury. That wasn't him, was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that there. <laughs> was it was the issues at training? Not personally with with anyone I may or may not have just mentioned, but th- this was a question coming up. Um, first and foremost, I'll get you to answer: Did Tommy have a certain player he liked? And secondly, looking at the squads and the individual players, you couldn't have all got on all the time, surely? No, we didn't. We, there was I made, there was plenty of. Head button at the time because you had some old heads in the places. You had some ones like myself who were coming through and mm. getting to be that age, and mm. a couple of others that were younger and stuff like that, and had different ideas. And mm. certain guys who just maybe thought they were better than they were. Um, so, but Tommy just Tommy, a player for Tommy is Tommy wants you to have heart. Yeah, he don't care if you're not the most skillful player in the world. Yeah, because if you've got heart, it'll get you through most situations. Mm. Um, 
if you put your body on the line, if you put your head where most people won't put their feet, um, then he's he'll stand by and, and do things like that. He also then he also could be easily swayed in his opinion on certain things um, by certain players, um, which wasn't always good because Tommy's coaching ability mm. was more about the motivation. It wasn't about the actual skills and, and what to do things. Yeah. Uh, and certain people thought they had those abilities and certain players didn't think so. Um, so, yeah, there, there, were, there were some rough moments, but that's football. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't have to be each other. You don't have to be best friends. Um, you just have to play as a team. Mm. And generally, we did. Um, oh, absolutely, you did. You made the bloody finals in '96. <laughs> Yeah, for for a bunch of misfits, we we weren't too bad. I so. know, and and that's what I was going to say too. And for different reasons, you came along at two different clubs, one town teams. And I know Campbelltown's part of Sydney, but it's a bit like Cronulla, and and people that have never been to Sydney don't understand that there are cities within cities, and they are all kind of cut off to themselves. If you know what yeah. I mean, Penrith's part of Sydney, but it's Penrith. Campbelltown's part yeah. of Sydney, but it's Campbelltown. Wollongong, just outside, but it's its own thing. You know what I mean? So um, you came along at the Steelers um, and you you were on the wave of something incredible in 92. And then at the Magpies, I know it wasn't the same because it wasn't a prelim final, but for all the years of hardship in Campbelltown and, and all these battling people that just want a winning team, you were you, you kind of were part of two magical things for two different groups of fans. And even though as a professional player, you probably don't look at it the same as as those fans in those eras. But I mean, it, it was all. I, I assume that when you look back at those little memories, particularly the '96 field goal, the 50-minute field goal against the Bears, and then the, the probably the entire '92 Steelers season and everything you did then in Wollongong, have you thought back about that and said, "Well, you know what? Like I, you know, I I didn't play in a grand final. Or I didn't get to play for my state, but." I was part of two amazing things where two different big groups of fans are always going to remember me. Yeah. I, I look back on it and, mate, I still get people from Canola that remember me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, but it's just, I, I, I look back on it in, in a certain little bit of disappointment in myself more than anything. What we did, I, I think, was fantastic in a lot of places. I just think I should have... Um, I'd set goals that I wanted to make football in Sydney. I, um, if I'm talking to younger, if I was talking to my younger self again today, I would say, mate, you've done that. Now we set them. Um, yeah, but how many people? Yeah. How many people got to play 121 first row games as well? Yeah, you know. But I was there all up for about 12 years, mm. so I should have, and the end, I should have played more. Mm. Um, but I, I loved my time doing what I did. Mm. Um, would I change things a fraction? Yes. Um, but mate, it, no matter what you change, you then change something else. Yeah. So um, you can't look back too harshly. You have just got to try and think. Okay, well, yeah, we, we can't. We don't get to do it over, unfortunately. So, um, but yeah, the, the clubs themselves, uh, the West Boys, there's a lot of good boys there, mate, and and um, that maybe should never have played first grade, but they did, mm. um, and it was because. Tommy believed in that heart. They had heart. The boys, they, they might not have the first grade skills all the time, but they had the heart and they had the session. Um, maybe if they had a little bit more specified skill coaching at mm. the time, they may have gone better. Mm. Um, but we gave everything we had. Like you say that North Sydney game, mate, I remember it because I was, I was praying to God it went over because I had nothing left. Uh, you were in the background, <laughs> mate. You are in the famous shot where... Um, Willis is looking at it, he's looking at it, he's looking at it, and you're in the background going, get fucked, that's going over. That's going <laughs> over. Look, mate, I, I just stood there when it, when, it, when it, I didn't have the energy to even celebrate it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, and look, I, I, I want to I talk about that, that game for a minute. Because, um, look, in 97, you play another 20 games, or I think it is 20 games in, in 97. Yep. Um, and, and and from what you've told me at the top of the co- at the top of the podcast, you weren't ready to, to give it up. You also got a country jersey in '97, so that's yep. a that's a mighty way to finish um, individually. 
But for, for me personally in 96, that, that Monday night game, and if people don't remember, and I said the same thing in the Scandals podcast, Monday night football in the mid-90s was a completely different beast. It was huge. Mm. There was yeah. Dragon. Were you? Did you know Dragon was playing at Campbelltown Stadium, Arana Park, before you guys ran on, or were you too busy out the back warming up? Because oh, Dragon's, man, one, Dragon's one of the biggest rock bands of all time. <laughs> yeah, I would have huge. That's about all I would have recognised, so... And, and, um, and look, the other thing too that, that I remember is um, Willie Newton, uh, local junior, he was supposed to take the, the shot at goal. He got caught on the last tackle. And then another local junior steps up and takes the field goal. I think that was a, a nice way. And people forget too that I, I guess memory is a funny thing, Billy, because you know some people I talk to at the local pubs around here, they go, yeah, that field goal got us into the finals. Well, it, it didn't because it kept us in the race. The next yeah. week at Brookvale... The Magpies got flogged, and I think you got a try that day, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then you had to you had to beat the Steelers, ironically, in the last round at Arana. Yeah. Um, I think it was in front of 2,000 people from, from Google. And it was either that year or the year before. Now, you, you need to confirm this for me, Billy, because I've asked so many people about this, and no one can remember. Was that the day where it was that windy that Andrew Leeds, or the Steelers kicked off, someone kicked off, the ball went into the air and it went back over the kicker's head, back down 20 metres, back over the head, down the other end of the field. Oh, I don't remember one of those. No, no I, I can't. God I damn can it, remember Billy. days down at Wollongong. Come on. Um, I can remember days down at Wollongong where we've kicked off into a southerly and it, you've kicked, it went to the quarter line or the 22 metre line at that stage and landed short of the 10 yard line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so they good. didn't have the sub. They didn't have the sub and stand there at that that stage. So. Oh, the big one, yeah, yeah. Jesus. So uh, okay. So what about ninety seven then? So you, you you played twenty games, and and personally for yourself, ninety seven. Unfortunately for the Magpies, I guess you want to talk about hangovers and and the peak of, of Tommy's reign was ninety six. Ninety seven, mm. a split comp, very competitive. I've still got VHSs that my uncle Paulie recorded where the Magpies would beat the Roosters one weekend and then drop a game to the Rabbitohs the next weekend. And then 98-99, let's not talk about them at all. But um, what happened at the, 90, at the end of 97? Did you want to keep playing? Mate, I had a contract for the next year. You did? Okay. I did. Yeah, what it happened? Got paid, it got paid out and sent on the way. But how did that happen? Who told you that? Um, mate, it all come about... I um. Part of the reason was uh, about three weeks or uh, four weeks before then, we were playing at Warra. Mm-hmm. And during training during the week, um, yep. we were doing a drill right at the end. Where we, uh, and I'd offloaded the ball to somebody else. And Jimmy Smith hit me with a tackling pad, but I didn't. It was after the ball had gone, so I'd relaxed. Mm-hmm. And I got upended and I landed right on my tailbone. Mm-hmm. And, mate, had <laughs> the worst pain of my life. Yeah. And, but, we thought, okay, we'll just see how it goes. And I wanted to play because it was the Steelers. I wanted to play against the Steelers. Yep. Um, shouldn't have. I should have bit the bullet. But again, I did. We warmed up um, in the warm up, and I I could run, but I couldn't stretch out full stride. Yep. Um, I told the skills coach at the time that I couldn't. Um, and certain things happened. The game we got beaten quite soon. Then a couple of issues come out where I got caught not leaving the market quick enough and stuff like that and got left behind it. Mm. Tommy called me over the coal for it and said, why didn't you do it? I said, well, I couldn't, couldn't sprint. He said, well, what can you tell us? I said, I did. I mm. told the skills coach. Mm. It's up to him to tell you. Was, was that in front of the whole team? Did Tommy do that in front of everyone or was that one-on-one? In, in the video session, yeah. Yeah, okay. That, that wouldn't have felt nice. And so I was, I was dropped for the next week to we were playing the Crushers. Mm. And that was, I think that was the actual when the weekend that Diana died. Yep. yep. Um, you, and you had to beat the Crushers at Suncorp to make the finals. Well, I, was, I got dropped back to reserve grade, and that week, during the week, um, they had sacked for the next year the whole reserve grade squad. Jesus. So was I that, got was up that there. normal? Was that normal? No. <laughs> it was because <laughs> it was such a, it was being turning out such a bad year and everything else like that, and Tommy just wanted to put a broom through the place. Yeah. So I. In the dressing room, before we ran out, I grabbed the whole um, 
reserve grade squad mm. and pulled him in close and said, Good look, mate, I knew we were up here, we're in Brisbane at, at, um, at Blank Park, mm. um, and we're in for a flogging to nothing mm. if we don't do something. Mm. So I pulled them all together and said, and I used fairly um, indicative Gra- words. Graphic wording. <laughs> yeah. And said, here's your chance to teach these people that you are worth something and you are worth keeping. Yep. Um, and uh, the only two people in there at that stage that heard that was the skills coach mm. and the former player we were discussing. Mm-hmm. Um, we, so so, we the, so getting... the two blokes are, that, that you think at the Magpies done the dirty on you the most? Well, I thought it was one, and I found out later on it was the other. Okay. Um, and um, we, we ended up losing the game, but we got beaten by about two points rather than being flogged 40 mm. Um So we you know, and then I went back in the first grade the following week because the injury started getting better. I could run again. I could sprint again. So, mm. um, And then at the end of the year, I got called into Tommy's office over in Campbelltown because I was working for the club as well at the same time. as part of their membership, yeah, yeah. their sponsorship team. Yep. And told my services would no longer be needed for the next year. Um, we're going to pay you out. And, and they said, we're going to offer you this. I said, no, no, you're going to pay me a lot. Yep. You want me to go? Mm. We, end up, we end up agreeing on a certain figure and... And it was the first year where I was starting to earn some really decent money and stuff like that. So I um, and I blamed the the wrong person over it. It wasn't until I um, a couple of years later I was talking to Singo. I'll go back to that. It, it, it changed a whole lot of things for me because I'd been talking to some friends through News Limited um, that I'd met through one of the sponsors about a job, and mm. he was talking about giving me the, mani- the marketing manager's role for Volkswagen at the time in mm. Sydney. Mm. Um, and then couldn't get another team. For, I don't know why. Mm. Um, I, my, my wife at the time wasn't keen to go to England, yep. um, which I now regret. Yep. Um, but so I, we said that we'll both. Her parents lived on the Gold Coast. I was from there, and she said oh, I want to go back. So we started driving back. The HR manager from Volkswagen had told me that um, I wasn't going to get the role. Mm. Halfway back to the Gold Coast, the GM who I'd been dealing with, who'd come back from overseas, rang me and said, so when are you coming in? And I said, well, I'm not, your HR manager told me I'm not getting the role, so um, I'm, I'm halfway to the Gold Coast. Mm. He said, well, I run the effing company, not him. Mm. And I said, mate, it's too late. I'm going back. I bumped into Singo at a, an event at one of the pubs he'd bought yep. when I was working in Sydney Yep. Um, a few years later. And he, I talked to him about it, and he said, no, no, it wasn't the one you want. It was the other guy. Mm. He's the one that stabbed you in the back, and Tommy listened to him. He said, Tommy tried to get you back, mm. but you'd already gone back to the Gold Coast. Once you, the season started, he realized you'd made a mistake, mm. and he wanted to get you back. And I said, oh. So is that the one it that... Cost, so is it that cost the one, three is, years at least, I think. So. Is that the one that actually left the Magpies as well and ended up um, co-coaching with Phil Gould in 99 against the Magpies? Uh, possibly. <laughs> uh, okay, fair enough. But uh, what, how much would it have taken for Tommy to give you a call? Would you have came back if Tommy made the call? Mate, yeah. Yeah? If, uh, mate, I would have asked for at least two, three years contract, but yeah, I would have come back. Yeah. I was, I was still playing. I was playing state league up here in, in on the Gold Coast. So well, it, wouldn't have I, been... it wasn't a good year for me because I, I did spit the dummy a little bit when I was still down in one because we didn't come back until early January. Yeah. Um, and the only training I was doing was just pool work. I just swam and swam and didn't do a lot of I trained one session with the um, with one of the local teams down there one day and they were doing 200 and something. It almost killed me because mm. I had been on the running park for about three months. So. Mm. Um, um, but yeah. look, it wouldn't have been much worse than, than the forward pack and some of the plays that got to start for the Magpies in 98 and 99. Um, I'm sure it would have helped the club if you, if you could get back. So, you know, it's funny how it all works out, eh? It is, mate. It is. It, it, that's life. And you, you move on and go, you go with things. It, I do remember Desi coming. and mate, Desi, I wish I had known Desi a lot earlier than I did because yeah. Desi was one of those those dedicated trainers mm. uh, and someone that liked dragging people with him. Mm. Um, and he did a few, helped me with a lot of stuff. He, he also crucified me one day coming because we were living down at Wollongong and he was driving up and he said, okay, I'll keep you living at Thrill and I was living down at Fig Tree Heights. I said, mm. 
the missus dropped me off at the at the par- at the bottom of Bulleye Pass there, and he was supposed to pick me up before he come out and took off. Mm. I'm standing on the side of the road, and he's just driven straight past me. <laughs> Step going. So I had the no, mobile. No mobile, phone. no mobile phones then either. No, I had the mobile, and the only number just... I had was um, the club. Yeah. So I rang the club and said, "Mate, I'm going to be late." Um, and they said, "Why?" And I said, "Well, Debbie, Debbie's supposed to pick me up, and he's." He's just driven straight past me, going up all I pass. He said, mate, I'll get there, I'll hitchhike. So I did. I, I hitchhiked the ride up to the top of the pass, um, jumped up and got onto another road and hitchhiked again and got the train about 45 minutes late. Um, so and, did, did you hitchhike um, from Wollongong to, to training at Campbelltown? Yep. Brilliant. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then Daddy arrived at training and they've all... Everyone knew about it because somebody had told everyone, and um, and um, and he's gone, Daddy, how are you going? Is he all right? Yep. Said, have you forgotten anything? And he's gone, No, nah, nothing. No, I've got everything. He said, Have you forgotten someone? <laughs> and he's gone, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he tended to be one of the greatest coaches of the modern era. Mate, yeah, he's Daddy, yeah, Daddy. Had all, or even then, thought about the game a lot, mm. um, and was the, one of the most fittest players you'll you'll get running around. So, Billy, um, we're, th- this is a world. This is a record. This is episode ten, and we're almost <laughs> hit ninety minutes, mate. That's <laughs> that's brilliant. And and before we before we finish, I did say at the top we mentioned your side business. Um, yep. So, did, did you want to talk about so so just in case anyone's out there looking at the moment, did you want to talk about um, so what, what kind of what, what kind of salesman are you, Billy? What could you sell me, mate? I've like I said, well, I'm now fifty three this year. So I've I, my selling career started at Cronulla mm-hmm. when I was uh, what the first year when they first got me down there. I was they had me in a sawmill that didn't last long. <laughs> um, I didn't like splinters. I'm glad you got out of there too. <laughs> Um, so I started my first job was door to door vacuum cleaners with Kirby vacuum cleaners. Oh, Kirby, I remember it was them. a great learning experience. Um, yeah. And from then on, mate, I've sold everything from well, advertising, both radio and and magazine stuff. I've um, I was up here when I came back up here. I um, was state manager for one of the poker machine companies when I. Once I, after a couple of years of being back up here with them for two years, I spent five years as the estate manager. Then I wanted to um, furniture, commercial furniture, uh, <laughs> construction companies. I went back to the gaming companies and lived in Sydney for another two years and, and worked down there. Um, I've come back. I was a national product manager for a crane company up here for two and a half years until they hit financial problems. Um, and then I did some... I was, membership stuff for a plumbing association. And just recently, I was selling um, semi-trailers for a new Thai company um, that was producing them over there and trying to sell them here. But again, management above me made, made some decisions that um, weren't most probably profitable. Um, and that's been made redundant. So at the moment, I'm just doing my little weekend business with the markets with f and Art. So if anybody looks up that, you can find out what we do. But if you're looking um, for a but, shit hot salesman, look up Billy. Yeah, look up Billy Dunn. I'm, I'm looking at jobs in Sydney and on the, in Queensland. The Sydney jobs have to be a little bit better paying for me to move back down there. Mate, they have to. If you want to live down here, bloody oath. Yeah, there's a couple I'm talking to at the moment. Um, but yeah, mate, I'm I'm always willing to to look at any role. I'm happy to sell anything as long as you're happy to teach me the product. I know how to talk to the people yep. um, and how to deal with them and how to. Get get through there through to them, but you need to teach me your product. I'm happy, and I learn very quickly. So I'm, I I never say, look, what can't you sell? You can sell anything. That's it. Um, exactly. You just got to like the product you sell. So. That's it. Well, that, that's the thing. You got to believe in what you sell, right? So yeah, yeah. It, well, I do. I, I can't lie to people. I, I, I'm the same as you, Billy. I I done one day of door to door selling house phones. I yeah. I worked. Funny enough, I fe- I worked at Fantastic Furniture. I couldn't do it. Done a lot of things, Billy, and some of the things you've said, I'm just sitting here crossing my arms, shaking my head, going, you know, I 
It sounds like we're, we've kind of gone in the same path, except for the fact that I wasn't a talented first grade rugby league player. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Billy, well, some people say neither was I. No, no, I, I <laughs> whoa, no, 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 no. There's going to be a lot of people out there, Billy, tonight and in, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, they're going to listen to this podcast and they're going to get a lot of enjoyment out of it because you gave a lot of fans a lot of enjoyment. Thank you very much tonight, Billy, and we will get you on again, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm sure we will talk again very, very soon. Anytime, Curtis, anytime at all. Good on you, Bill. Cheers, mate. See you, mate.